Good morning. I had no idea I would have a room this big. I'm a little intimidated, I'll be honest. Um, I'm not a natural speaker, but I will try my best. But let me first start with thank you for trusting Microsoft Security as your partner in your Zero Trust journey. We really, really appreciate your partnership. Um, and I'm looking forward to telling you a little bit more about our innovations in this space. And I hope they help you advance in your journey. First, real simply, I kind of call this like a, a destroyed bird's nest. Um, we did have a perimeter, and, but now there's too many things outside, and this is just going to get worse with Gen AI. And so as we look at this, it's, it's really, really difficult for you to secure your estate when this is your reality. There's kind of three core problems that we want to help you fix. The first one is it's all about the end user experience. They really want, they don't want a friction filled experience and they want everything to be super, super fast. And they don't want any suboptimal routing of their, their connections because it causes uh, latency and a poor user experience. But it's also really important for the organization to have full visibility from, this, um, from, the, from the perimeter. And in here, when you ask a customer, uh, how do you know what is actually active in your environment right now? Usually they cannot tell you. And this is a really important control plane for visibility. And the third key problem we have to focus on is identities do get compromised, as do devices. And we just don't want lateral movement. So we really need to take away all implicit trust from the network. This is all the foundation of the zero trust is all around how you achieve moving from that, you know, implicit trust on the infrastructure to a least trust model where everything is verified explicitly. Conditional access is the foundation of Microsoft's Zero Trust policy. Everything is built from conditional access. And we're really excited this past July, we entered the security service edge market, and we are now generally available, have a solution that allows any device, any operating system, any network to connect to any resource, all using conditional access. You can now put conditional access in front of anything, including as long as that has an IP address, you can use conditional access to govern uh, access controls. We have three products that make up our solution, Entra Private Access, Entra Internet Access, and our Defender for Cloud Apps, which is our CASB. We have some really exciting new innovations that I will very quickly here show you them. This is one of my favorite, is the ability to discover all your applications and then seamlessly onboard them onto Entra. Similarly, in internet access, I'm really excited that we've added TLS inspection. This was a critical capability. And similarly, we now support universal continuous access evaluation. So if any of those conditions like user risk score or the identity was to be stolen, we can immediately revoke access worldwide. But enough about that. I'd like to welcome John um, Seville on stage to give you a little bit of a look behind the scenes and to see all these new capabilities in action. Hey. Thanks, John. Hey, everyone. Um, super, super excited to be able to showcase the phenomenal work the Entra team have been doing. I'm pretty sure it's the last time I'll be asked to present, though. I sat down with a makeup artist and she went, wow, there's a lot of work here. So I think trying to avoid a disco light effect off my head with the lights is, is probably just too much effort. But what I went really to focus on was talking about some of the architecture behind the capabilities, and I get to actually showcase a lot of these things. So for those of you who know me, I like to draw stuff. So I want to kind of some, draw some things. When we think historically, I'm going to start off with our private resources. So we have this idea that we have a private network. We have various resources within there. And then we have our client. And if we think about our client that is not local in that network, historically, we would run a VPN. Now, with that VPN, we typically only have some initial check. And then 
that access isn't integrated with our identity, that access isn't tied into the specific resource we're trying to do. It can be operationally complex to manage, to upgrade, to patch. I don't get great visibility into the traffic, and we're really not getting the full posture of the device of the user, and devices are very commonly compromised. So what we want to focus on instead is many of us have our fantastic Entra, and I want an identity-centric secure services edge solution. And that's what we have right now. So I can think about, I'm still going to have these private resources. We now have our secure service edge solution. And we kick off, we need a client on the device. So I have my SSE client. And that is going to establish that connection to my edge. Now, what are one of the things we love about Entra is conditional access. If we think about that single policy engine, we're really used to the idea of, hey, I have my conditional access, and then I get all of these fantastic signals that we can leverage. I can think about, hey, I want a certain authentication strength. So we think, sure, multi-factor authentication, but also, well, maybe I want phishing resistant. You've already heard the word passkey 400 times this morning already. I might require certain roles to be able to use something, and maybe I'm using PIM to elevate up to that. I might be taking risk signals. But we have this great policy engine we're used to, but now that conditional access is going to be the same thing that's going to protect everything we do via that secure service edge. Now, obviously, the final component we need here is a connector. In those private networks, there's going to be some connector that, again, establishes that connection to our secure edge. And then as the client, providing I pass those checks, providing I've been given access to that resource, well, now, great. I go and get a fantastic, seamless experience, no matter where I am. So I'm going to jump over quickly. And if we look at an example of this, just to walk through those key constructs. So here, if we take a look at our global secure access, we scroll down, look at our connections and client download. Well, straight away, we can see, yes, we have Windows 10, Windows 11, as we would expect, but also Android, iOS, Mac OS. And one of the great things here is if I have Defender for Endpoint already on my iOS and Android, that's it. There is no additional client or agent I need to deploy. Once the client is deployed, I go and configure, well, what traffic do I want to actually go ahead and send via the client? Is it the Microsoft traffic, i.e. my M365, private access traffic, which is our focus right now, but also our internet traffic? And then, of course, we need the connectors themselves. So the connectors are what are going to establish that connectivity from our private networks through to the SSE edge to facilitate that all-up communication. So those are really key for that end-to-end -end connectivity. And the connectors are interesting. Uh, actually, quick show of hands, who's actually deployed a connector? OK, a number of people. It's a fun experience. Uh, you enjoy those many steps. You enjoy creating the resource. You enjoy then connecting it to your entry tenant. So one of the things that's now available is often we have those private networks. Well, they're in a cloud environment. Now, obviously, for many of us, it's Azure but it could be AWS, it could be Google Cloud. And what we now have the ability to do is, that's supposed to be a basket, imagine a marketplace, I can go to the marketplace and say, hey, I want the connector. So that process that in the past was 30 minutes and lots of clicks and action I had to do, it will now just go and provision that connector and will connect it into your entry tenant. So that big 30 minute process that we had before is now five minutes. And now, because it's all automated, I can build it into, for example, my infrastructure as code. It becomes far more easy to scale this out and leverage that solution. And so I wanted to just showcase that as well. So if we jump over here, here we can see we're looking at the network connector in Google. We could also go and look at it in AWS. Of course, as we would expect, we see it in the Azure marketplace. And just to demonstrate the first few steps of that, I literally say, hey, I want to create this particular appliance. I would then go in as normal for a resource, specify a resource group, a region, and as 
part of that overall configuration, just tell it, well, what is the virtual network I want you to hook into? And then it would be up and running. So it's really going to simplify that whole experience. Now, the next thing I'm going to think about is how do I quickly onboard to this solution? So I might think about, well, I'm using a VPN today. And I want to start using this. I want to quickly get some conditional access to apply. So one of the things we can do here is I can have a quick access. My private network has some kind of CIDR range, for example. And I want to expose a network segment. Maybe it's multiple different IP ranges, different ports, different protocols. I control that. But I'm going to say, hey, I want to do quick access. So I'll get a special quick access type application made up of those side of one, two, three, these ports, these protocols. I can expand it over time. But it's a really simple way to, hey, I want to get from the VPN to this identity-centric solution and quickly onboard to that. So if we jump over again, so for our global secure access, quick access, we can just jump down, look at our quick access, and what we're seeing here are those various segments made up of the IP ranges, the ports we want to include, the protocols we want to improve. We can just go and add a new segment and select, hey, is it TCP and or UDP? What are the IP addresses, the ports? And we would now expand that segment. And when we have the quick access, a key thing here is we can apply a conditional access policy to it. So here we can see we have quick access. And we have all of the regular capabilities. I can target particular users, groups, roles. Our target resource is that very special, as we can see here, quick access application, which is created for us. As we create more granular apps for more granular segments, we would see particular apps for them. But then it's all of the regular controls we would expect. In this case, hey, we can grant access based on requiring multi-factor authentication. We could require a certain device health. We could require a certain authentication strength. So we have all those regular conditional access capabilities, and they're just going to work, in this case, with our quick access. So this is a great first step in onboarding, and hey, I want people to be able to access things through that experience. But obviously, that's step one in the journey. What we really want to do is to get to more granular controls for particular applications, for particular solutions. And one of the fantastic things is now, once we've done the quick access, well, now we've got the traffic going through the solution. So what I can now apply on top of that is we have this concept of app discovery. So imagine I'm looking at all of the traffic through the quick access, and it will now show me well, hey, you're accessing these particular IPs. You're accessing these ports and protocols. I can see how many sessions, how many devices, how much traffic, which will help me prioritize. And then from the app discovery, I can quickly go and create well, a unique app with its various attributes and go and apply its own conditional access policies to get me that granular point I really want to get to. It's that journey. Hey, quick access first, get things onboarded, very simple migration from the VPN discover the traffic flowing through it, and now start to prioritize, well, what do I actually want to do and create specific applications? If we go and explore, what I can see now is we select our application discovery, and it's showing me all the traffic. I can see the target, be it IP or fully qualified domain name, which protocol was used, the destination port, the number of users, transactions, devices, amount of data, when it was accessed. So I get this fantastic amount of information to help me make that decision on where should I start getting more defined and granular apps for a more granular set of conditional access. I can just select whatever particular segment I see here. I say I want to add it to a new application. I give it a name. I can associate it to a particular connector group. And I'm done. And at this point, it's just another application that I can now go through and define its own conditional access policy for or add it to another conditional access policy that meets the requirements I have. Now, that's fantastic. And I keep showing these IP addresses. And I'm sure all of the users in your environments use IP addresses. It's just natural to them. Yep, I remember that, especially IPv6 rolls off the tongue. Um, they use DNS names. 
And so if I think of my environment, well, what you've done is you've got various DNS servers in your environment that look after certain zones. And when a user is in your corporate environment, well, they have connectivity to the DNS servers. You've probably plumbed in those domains as default suffixes. So if I'm on the corporate site, I just enter a nice little single label domain, and the user's using the resource. But how does this work when the user's now on this client? It has no connection or path to that DNS server. So what we can now do is we have the idea of private DNS. So what private DNS is going to let me do is specify those particular zones that I have available within my internal DNS infrastructure. I tell it which connectors have a path to talk to it. And then the entry SSE will go and plumb via the SSE client its default suffix to include that zone. So now as the user, it's completely seamless. If I'm in the office, fantastic. I can do the single label names. I could do the fully qualified domain name if I'm a really advanced user. But now I'm out of the office, I do exactly the same thing. If I enter it with the suffix, the GSA client knows that's part of the SSE solution. It will plumb it through via the client to the SSE edge to the connector to go and resolve it to the DNS server. If I just enter the single label name, it'll do the same thing. It's added as a default suffix. So I just get this phenomenal end user experience. And so if we jump over to here, it's super simple to plumb. Now I'm going to dive over and look into the GSA, that quick access area again. But this time I want to look at that private DNS tab. And it's so easy. You can see here I've got a couple of suffixes defined already. But I would just say I want to add a new DNS suffix. I specify the name of it. And I'm done. It's associated with that connector group. And now that would be plumbed all the way through to the GSA clients. So they understand, hey, I need to send the traffic to the SSE edge when I hit this suffix. So let's, let's try and sort of layer a few of these in terms of looking at some demos. Now, if you've ever seen my YouTube channel, you might have seen me done something very similar to this in the past. Now I'm the user. And what we're showing here on the screen is a few different areas. So I'm looking at my Global Secure Access, the SSE client, and we're looking at the traffic area at the top. So this helps me actually understand if I was trying to troubleshoot what's happening in my environment. We have a command prompt window and we have just an explorer. So right now, this machine, if we go and look in detail at our DS Reg CMD, it's going to show me that I am Entra ID joined, or Azure ID joined in the old days. It's not joined to any traditional Active Directory, so there shouldn't be any Kerberos tickets, which we can see as we look at our K list. Now, I, as the user, well, I'm used to just going to a certain name. So again, the private DNS is being called here when I'm trying to access this server one that's part of the woodgrove.local zone. And we can even see on the background, we see that port 53 traffic briefly show up, which is, hey, DNS traffic is flowing via the connector. This SMB share was made available as an application so it can have its own sets of conditional access applied. In this case, hey, I want to perform an MFA. Adam is not doing very well. We've got that more traditional text-based. Hopefully, it's going to improve over time. But performs that MFA, enters the code received, and now I'm authenticated. And then we can see the 88 port traffic, which is Kerberos. So I've got access to the SMB share because behind the scenes, it went and spoke to my domain controller. So now if I go and look at my K list, we can see I have tokens. I have a ticket granting ticket. I also have tickets regarding KIFs for actually talking to SMB, but I got that great experience. Now we'll pivot slightly to an iPad scenario. So I've tried to access a resource and it's complained here that I don't have access because I'm not a member of the required group or don't have the role directly. So what do we do where we have a role, but it should be just in time. So the user is going to go as normal into PIM. If they look at what their eligible assignments are for groups, I can see I have this RDP privilege group. So we just need to go and activate it. So I'll be very diligent. I pick the minimum time. Yep, eight hours. Very detailed reason. Stuff on fire. 
basically. And I'm going to activate. So I now have that group membership added as part of my token. Now, additionally, while we're looking at this, something to call out here is that I try and access this again. But while we're waiting for this, if we quickly go and look, we're also using just the Defender for Endpoint client here. You can see down the bottom, we have that global secure access. So I don't require a separate agent. But if we let it continue through, we can see I completed the MFA requirements and I'm now connected happily to my resource. I'll talk about a third scenario. Who's using Azure? So hands up who's using Azure. All right, you can stay. Now, very often when you're using Azure, you use certain resources that are not part of your virtual network. Imagine I have a storage account, a managed database, whatever it is, and I want to more granularly control the traffic. So what do we do? I don't want to make it publicly accessible. Well, what I do is I create a private endpoint. So that private endpoint points to that particular instance of that specific resource. And that's great, but it's only the network. What we can now do is I can hook that in and make it available via the entry SSE as a private access resource. I can then apply conditional access on top of it. So, hey, I'm using private endpoint to take care of the networking part, but I'm going to build on top of that and actually then also apply conditional access to, for example, require multi-factor authentication, to require an authentication strap, require a certain device strength. Right now, we're looking at the fact that this storage account has a private endpoint. We can see the detail of that private endpoint if we go and look at the networking. So it exists in a particular VNet in a particular subnet. And the key point now is that if I actually go and try to connect to this, so I'm in my Azure Storage Explorer, I go and connect as normal, just using something using a shared access signature. But because I also made this available as part of a quick access application that requires certain conditional access capabilities, well, it's going to tie in and now it's going to ask me to do an MFA. And we can see Adam's actually learned some lessons since the last time, is at least moved past the text-based MFA, and now we're using the Authenticator app. But I'm layering on top of that basic network functionality the private endpoint gives me to now also add all of the posture capabilities I get with conditional access. Uh, could be user risk, device health, anything I want is now available and usable in conjunction with the private networking capabilities I get with the private endpoint. But the private access, fantastic. But there's a whole other side, right? You have the idea of the internet access. So I can go and draw, hey, we have the good old internet over here. And additionally, many of us are using Microsoft 365. Microsoft 365 is actually treated as a separate traffic type by Entra. And the reason is, if you think of the Entra SSE Edge and all those edge locations it uses, well, Office uses those same edge locations. So when we turn on using Office as part of our SSE solution, you get the least number of hops, you get the lowest latency, you get the highest resiliency, you get the best performance. So we get a whole set of benefits just by leveraging this M365 and my SSE client. Now, another thing, this obviously ties into conditional access. Well, this SSE client gives me the ability to, in conditional access, to have this idea now of a compliant network. We can think ordinarily we might have IP ranges or geos as part of conditional access. But we have these risks today that a user takes their device anywhere, they connect to any network, and there's some bad thing on that network. There's some person in the middle that then goes and captures tokens that does bad things. With the compliant network check, I can make a resource only available if that client machine has the SSE client on it. So what that would now mean is you can't get a person in the middle. There's no way to go and grab those tokens, so it increases my overall resiliency for everything I'm doing. 
Additionally now, be good. as part of... <laughs> It's encouraging. I feel good. Um, as, as part of the um, conditional access, when I want to do the web content filtering rules, it can now use all of the capabilities of conditional access. So it's no longer just that concept of, well, it's allowed or it's not. All of those abilities will go through and apply. So we think of the traffic as we start off in our GSA client. We're going to go to our security. So we have a security profile which is that first layer, which is what we then link to a conditional access policy. So in our security profiles, we have a baseline profile. Now, this is going to apply to everything. We don't have to link it to any particular conditional access policy, and we link it to other types of policy. Now, in this case, it's web content filtering. And we can see, well, we're blocking AI applications. We're blocking gambling. We're blocking gaming. We allow LinkedIn. In addition to that baseline profile, I can then define security profiles that can be more specific. So for the sales department, for example, we're going to allow Dropbox. Now, because it's more specific, this would override that default profile. Now, this profile has a priority of 105, which is lower than the 100 priority of the higher risky users. So in this case, if there was a user risk, which would be based on conditional access, it could override the allowance of Dropbox from the sales department. And if we just go and look at that sales department policy, we can see all we're going to do now is link it to the people that are part of sales. And then for the resource, we're linking it to all internet resources via GSA. So we can see that over here, we're focusing on our internet resources. And then specifically, we're going to tie it. And then we can see over on the side, that particular profile, which was the sales department. So we've now got this combination of different profiles going on actually in the environment. The net result of this is as the user, which is what I'm now looking at their view, so I'm the user, I'm browsing the web, I try and go to an AI site, well, it's blocked because that was part of that default policy which blocks AI. I try and go to a different AI site, it's blocked as well. But I try and go to Dropbox, remember, that was allowed as part of my more specific policy for my sales department. Well, now I can go and get to that. So we can see all of those different things working together in conjunction with my conditional access. Now, the final thing I wanted to talk about before um, Sinead comes back on stage is if you're using Office today, one of the things you have is the idea that you get a token as a certain lifetime and things can happen. Critical user events can happen. Uh, the user might be disabled, the user might revoke their sessions, their user risk has increased, maybe I'm just, I've got some location-based policy. And what those first-party applications like Teams and Exchange and SharePoint and even the graph, we have this bucket and this idea of these revocation events. So I can think about, hey, when those critical user events happen, there are these revocation events. Well, now what's happening, that Secure Service Edge client also, and this is huge, goes and subscribes to those revocation events as well. So what that gives us is the ability now, I get continuous access evaluation for anything that's now going via the SSE client. So that's private access, that's internet access. So no more thinking about, well, hey, maybe the token was eight hours, and even after I do something, they continue accessing that resource. That may be way too long. Now, within a couple of minutes, they would actually go and get kicked out. As the administrator, I'm going to go and look at my users. I'm going to quickly go and find Adam. And from here, well, one of those revocation events would be revoking the session. So I'm going to say, hey, revoke the sessions, yes. And now that has successfully revoked. Now, as Adam, well, suddenly this little pop-up shows up. Global secure access action required. I have to sign in again. I have to respond to the challenge that the GSA client, that SSE client is giving me because of that revocation event. 
And if I now don't do that and just try and go back to the resources, so I'm quickly trying to get to Dropbox, maybe copy some stuff over, I go to it and I don't have access anymore because the GSA client no longer has a valid token it's accepting for me to try and access any resources. So if I had that really urgent need because, hey, Adam's gone off and got a great new job, we're very happy for him, but we want him off the network within a couple of minutes, we can do that now. So this is a really powerful bringing that. And again, they got kicked off of the internet site, but also that SMB connection I had earlier, I would get kicked off of that as well. Anything via the GSA client, I now get removed within a couple of minutes. So before I do any more demonstrations, uh, Sinead's going to come back and talk about some great customer journeys and stories, and I'll be back to show you uh, one more thing. So uh, Sinead, back on stage. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, and I'll put the PowerPoint back. Yes, please. How does he do it? I don't know. It's networking and it's identity and he makes it cool and he makes it simple and clear. It's awesome. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, so now switching gears a little bit, I want to invite a, a customer to tell you a little bit more about um, their experience with the product. They're one of our key design customers. And so I want to wel welcome Sasha to the stage. Hi, Sasha. Hi, Sinead. Okay. Good to be here. So maybe I start, Sasha, and just wanted to ask you, tell us a little bit about Falk. I, I'm not sure if many people in the room know this company. No. And if you can tell us a little bit about um, some of the pain points you were trying to solve. Um, so tell me a little bit of your story. Sure thing. So Falk is a global healthcare and emergency company. We're founded in Denmark. So when I say emergency, think blue lights, just without the police. So we are above 25,000 employees worldwide. And we are on a great journey with Zero Trust. I could tell you a lot about Falk, but since it's a over 100 years old company, however, let me give you two nuggets that kind of give you the complexity that we're working with. So number one, within the last 25 years, we've had 200 mergers and acquisitions. For some of you, that might give some insight to the IT landscape we we're dealing with. Number two is that we're a tender and contract business. So we need to be agile and we need to be able to scale in order to meet the needs of the market. The pain points that we've been looking into is very much on the uh, security point. We want to enhance the security. We want to have a better end user experience for all of our, our employees. But also the infrastructure is very heavy on hardware. That means on the agility, the scalability, we're a little challenged. So that is why we've been kind of moving on to uh, the next things. And, and tell me a little bit more about like what, what is the um, exact, um, actually I skipped some of my slides, here's rookie me. Um, um, so this is a little bit about, um, so these are the problems you were trying to, exactly. to solve. Okay. And in order to kind of address some of these pain points, we've taken a strategic approach. So some of the, we're on a digital journey and we have some pillars that we kind of lean into, which is zero trust architecture, it's strategic platforms, and it's also strategic partnerships, such as the one that we have with Microsoft. And our goal has been to build a, like a unified platform that is identity centric. And so can you tell me a little bit about um the journey from a people perspective or even how the technology or, or the technical um, components will change as you go to this new solution? Sure. So, so we've seen an opportunity that to take a more holistic view on zero trust with what uh, Microsoft is bringing to the table with Entra. And one of the key deliverables we've been having is taking the VPN legacy and then replacing it with zero trust network access. This means that we will have a way better security. We will bring identity control, such as multi-factor authentication to our private resources. And then the conditional access, the power of the conditional access is something we can apply. And then suddenly we're in a situation where all our frontline workers that are moving all around the world, they actually can have access wherever they are on their apps. So that is gonna be a huge game changer for us. And going further, I will say, it is also something where with the locations, with the operational um, issues we've been having with spinning up new location, closing them down, we're going to see a lot less complexity. We're going to see a lot less cost. So that is uh, huge for us. 
And into the future, like with the journey we're looking at, I'm not sure if I'm the only one here that all the new things with the security co-pilot we've seen here at Data Night, I think there's a lot of things that are going to be a huge game changer for us uh, when we go back and look into the future with Entra. Awesome. And then you are also on a governance journey. Can you just briefly touch on how this fits into your approach? Sure. So our initial journey was actually an identity and access management journey. So we were looking into how do we get, do we need a new application? And then that led us to the ID governance. And Microsoft has been such a huge help with sharing roadmaps, being really transparent of where they want to go with the Entra platform. And that then turned our identity and access management initiative into a zero trust initiative, suddenly bridging everything, not just identity and access management, but also targeting the network, which is a key for us. Awesome. Can you maybe tell us, um, maybe last question, Sasha, what were some of the lessons learned? Did everything go as planned as you were rolling this out? Well, Sinead does it ever. <laughs> I don't think so. Not in any projects I've been in, at least. You need to be able to adapt. And I will say the initial approach that we had, it did not work. We had a location-based rollout plan. We had to scrap it, and we've adjusted it. So instead, we're looking at applications and user groups. But we also found that now we're actually able to roll out much faster than we had first planned. So that is, that is even better and a big win for us. And like as a last thing, one of the primary drivers for an, our initiative were and will still be the realization of all the enhancements to the security. But as an add-on, we can see a huge decomplexity, or lessening the complexity, but also cost reduction in when we roll out this because we can decommission hardware, we can have uh, less hardware requirements for our stations, we can spin up faster. So as a cost-conscious organization, that is very important to us. And that also made our business case go through with flying colors. Well, thank you so much, Sasha. You've been a, you, you and your org have really helped us build a really great product. So I want to thank you for, and we look forward to keeping your trust on this uh, Zero Trust journey. Thank you for so. having us. Awesome. <laughs> Last Ignite, I share that Microsoft um, Digital itself was also on a, a Zero Trust journey. And they broke it into sort of three phases, uh, a special rollout for M365, and then a second one around VPN replacement, and then lastly, around how we do threat protection um, for the internet resources. So I wanted to give everyone a quick update. Before we GA'd, we rolled out to about um, 13,000 users, because we wanted that to be a GA criteria. And now they're in the process of completing the rollout, and we have about 250,000 users, about 1,200 sites all over the world. And we wanted to show you that we're on a path to both replace VPN appliances, replace firewalls, and also replace a whole bunch of routers and take a whole bunch. And I wanted to show you our trajectory on how we ourselves are also moving away from, uh, from a hardware-based model to this more software-driven security model. So with that in mind, I want to also tell you about some of the other customers. Um, these are key design customers who have been on a journey with us, who are also um, rolled out. And then we also have a growing set of partners and system integrators and GSIs all over the world in each of the markets, helping customers um, on their journey as well. One of the new things we wanted to announce was we're also taking a very um, ecosystem-centric approach to this category. And in particular, we believe that no one provider can provide everything to everybody. And so we wanted to have a, a, a fantastic model, not just one where, yes, we, we signed a nice um, agreement to partner. No, we believe in deep integrations. We, we uh, believe in uh, coexistence and working side by side, and also giving models for partners to extend and automate and deeply integrate with our product. Specifically for this Ignite, we have a number of partnerships um, that who have done deep integration with our solution. And I want to put them in kind of two different categories. One category is around how do you connect to the service and think of this as SD-WAN and how do you automate that so it's seamless and we want it, in it. We want it to be completely agnostic and you, customer, can choose your partner of choice for SD-WAN. We will work great with all of them. 
And the second thing we wanted to do is we wanted to actually extend the network security functions of the product. And we're super excited to have Netscope as one of our first partners who have done a deep product integration with our platform. So with that in mind, I want to invite John back on stage to just give you a little bit of a, a sneak peek into what does this look like for a customer and how might they experience this ecosystem. So John, take it away. Thank you so much. Okay, so we talked about these newer platform and the ability to build on top of this, but what's the challenge with internet traffic? Uh, we don't trust the internet. We tend to encrypt everything. And so if I'm sitting in the middle of my client machine and the site I'm trying to talk to, well, I'm the client. I'm trying to talk to this site over here. And we want to put SSE in the middle. Well, the challenge is you can see the fully qualified domain name. I can't even see the path. I can't see any of the content until now. So now we have the ability to do TLS inspection. We can actually go and see the full path of the request you're trying to see. We can go and see inside the traffic. Now, if you've ever played around with encryption, you know it's not necessarily a simple thing to go and peek inside TLS encrypted traffic. And it's not like Microsoft can just go and decrypt anything on the internet. Uh, and so, so how do we do this? So if you think about in your organization, you're going to have a PKI infrastructure. You're going to have great, I have a root certificate authority that your client machines trust. You then go and create those intermediary certificate authorities. And what we're going to do is we're going to take one of those and we're going to put it in a key vault. That key vault is then going to be leveraged by the SSE service to create a GSA intermediary certificate that it can now use to create certs for the site you're trying to talk to, to your client. So when my client wants to talk to site.com, SSE creates a certificate, so it's encrypted. SSE can then decrypt that traffic. It can inspect it. So it actually has eyes on the full path. I can go and look inside the traffic. And then assuming it's not been blocked in some way, hey, it goes and re-encrypts and sends it on to its final destination. So that alone, when I think of the category types capabilities, I now get huge numbers of great new capability in terms of that insight into things. So if we go and look, look at that, it's staying up. So this is the marvel of technology. Yes, yeah, so that's, that's worth it. So it's the saddest clap I've ever had. Uh, so I can go to TLS inspection. I point to that key vault where we put the key. I would now go and create a specific TLS inspection policy. I would go and link it to a brand new profile. So I'm going to go through and do that. I'm accelerating a little bit. We're going to use that policy that we created that uses the TLS inspection. And now I'll have visibility into that traffic. Obviously, we would now go and use that. We'd apply conditional access, et cetera. Now, by default, it is not going to look at traffic around health or finance or government or education. I could remove certain users from having that inspection happened. But now if I actually jump over to my client experience, there are many sites that's not just one category of traffic. So, OK, great. I'm going to go to msn.com. msn.com does search, and it does shopping and news. Ooh, gaming. I like gaming. So I jump over, and it's been blocked. Because in those categories we had at the start, we blocked gaming. Now, the path is the same. It's still msn.com. But as we go and peek over to this, notice it's got gaming as part of the path which we can now see. And to hammer this point home, if I go and look at the certificate it's using, yes, it's secure. But who is it actually being signed by? we can see it's being signed by that global secure access intermediate. That's how it can actually go and peek inside the traffic. And now I get that full set of capability to actually see what's going on. Now, that's great in terms of Microsoft can now build on the functionality. It can now give you richer features. But as we were talking about, there, it, there's a whole set of different capabilities you may want. One company can't build everything. So now what I can think of is once this traffic can be decrypted here, we can go and link into huge amounts of other functionality. 
You could think about having a whole buffet of features available from trusted partners. And Entra is that single traffic acquisition. It's that single, hey, I've got the conditional access policy, but now we can bring in the functionality you need on top of that platform to have super deep integrations. And what I want to talk about just quickly here as an example is Netscope. So Netscope have both an ATP and a DLP solution. I'm going to focus on the advanced threat protection area. But what they can do here is they have over 40 different intelligence feeds for malware, for ransomware. They use AI to detect those day zero things and those fake Microsoft login pages that try and steal your credentials. Hey, it will go and detect and protect from those as well. So what I can now do is, and I feel a lot more confident now when I'm clicking these things. So I can go through, and there's a marketplace. So I can go and look at, hey, what are the third party security solutions I want? I say, Netscope, ATP and DLP. We're going to go and apply that and add it to my tenant's SSE instance. And now once I have this available, it's going to open up a new type of policy. So it's all that same hierarchy. Hey, a conditional access goes to my security profile, which links to one or more policies. And in this case, I'm going to create a new threat protection policy. I'm going to use that Netscope provider that we just did. I'm going to go and look and say, oh, it's an engineering policy. I might have multiple of these so I can specify the order in which they run. And I'm going to focus on technology. I'm going to focus on cloud storage. I can select the type of activity. So is it upload? Is it download? Is it both of them? So we'll do both. And then what are my actions? Do I want to allow it? Do I want to just alert on it? Do I want to block it? So we will just go through and we'll block all of those. Hello? We'll go and block all of those things. And now I would go and link that through. And the end user experience from this point will simply be, hey, I'm going to x.com. I see exciting news for developers, 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 developers. It's on GitHub, so it's a technology site. And it's a gist, so it's going to be a download. I go to this, and I get sadness. It's a non-compliant action. So it's been blocked by the administrator. And if I jump back over and actually went and looked in the monitoring, if I look at the traffic logs and I could go and search for specific blocked actions, hey, I can go and see exactly as we would expect. I see that block action on that download. So with that, I will hand it back to Sinead. Thank you so awesome. much. Awesome. Thank you, John. Um, I'd like to invite um, Bob on stage here in our last, we're getting the warning to wrap up. Um, and I just want to welcome Bob from Netscope. So super glad to have you here today. And I wanted to just ask you um, a little bit, why, why did you do this integration and how do you think customers will benefit from it? Well, first of all, thank you very much, Sinead. And uh, you know, we are very excited to be on this journey with Microsoft. And you know, I think the demo speaks for itself. I'm not going to spend this whole session talking about our AI-powered data security and threat protection, because really the star of the show is simplicity, right? When you take the power of the combination of Netscope and Microsoft in a unified experience, what we're enabling is an advanced protection that is simple and accessible for every single Microsoft Entra customer. So this is really you know, if you think about it, complexity is the enemy of security. And today, Microsoft and Netscope together are solving that problem, and we're excited to partner with you. Awesome. Thank you, Bob. We really appreciate the partnership, and we look forward to seeing, making lots of customers happy with this deep integration. All right. Perfect. Thank, Thank you very, very much. much. Whoa. <laughs> and then with in the last few minutes, uh, July, we G8, um, and now even at Ignite, we, you know, three months later, we have a whole bunch of new capabilities now in preview. And we're not stopping there. We're all in on this category. So please come back and check every few months. There's going to be new things um, announced and then available. And I want to close and, and by saying thank you, thank you for trusting us. And we look forward to continuing to earn your trust. And I hope you, um, and please give us feedback. We love your feedback. It makes our product better. So thank you, everybody. <laughs>